Hi everyone and welcome to the Rise from Eden podcast with Steve and Dr. Mike. For today's episode, we've tried to improve the audio clarity to provide a better listening experience for you guys as we've talked about Carl Jung, spirituality, psychology, and so forth. Well, without further ado, here is the episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Rise from Eden podcast. In today's episode, episode two, we'll talk about complexes, the Jungian notion of complexes, how they came about, what they are, and so forth. As usual, with you today is yours truly, Steve, and our co-host, Dr. Mike. So what do you think complexes are, Dr. Mike? Uh, First of all, uh, welcome to everyone. Good day. And um, what we would like to do here is really talk about a very, very, very important topic. Those of you who've come across the works of Sigmund Freud, you probably know that Sigmund Freud said that the royal road to the unconscious is dreams. And so if you want to know exactly what the contents are of your unconscious mind, what you need to do is explore your dreams. Carl Jung says something a little different. Now, of course, uh, Carl Jung would say that dreams are fascinating and there are so many things that you could get by analyzing your dreams. And dream work is one way to understand uh, the, the very depths of the unconscious. But really the royal road to the unconscious is through the complexes. So if you want to understand what is inside your psyche, take a look at your complexes. If you were to go to an analyst, not necessarily just a union analyst, but if you were to go into psychotherapy, the very first thing that comes up in psychotherapy, which is addressed by you and the psychotherapist, are really those complexes that arise. And when these complexes arise in the context of therapy, the psychotherapist will be able to point it out and say, take a look this is what is happening. And at this point, when the complex arises, you are no longer in control. The complex is in control. And take a look at what is happening to you. You've lost your freedom. You are now acting like a robot. It is as if you are possessed by something and you're acting automatically without knowing exactly what it is that you are doing. But we're going to talk about that in detail later on. In order to understand what complexes are, it is very important to understand the very idea of a cluster, a grouping of things. And what I have in mind is one day you ride an airplane and you have a window seat and you're looking outside the window and you notice that as the plane goes higher and higher and higher, The houses that you see below form clusters. They're not random, one house here, another house here, another house there. They are actually grouped together because houses are built to form particular communities. So when you take a look at a particular subdivision, for example, as you're flying, you see that the houses are clustered together they form a kind of a grouping. They form a cluster. It is the same thing when you go to a restaurant. You will find several tables, but around each table, you will find chairs as well. So imagine the table and the chairs around the table, a cluster. And late at night, when you take a look at the sky, particularly if you're not in the city, because it's very difficult to see the stars when you're in the city. But when you're away from the city and it's very dark and you take a look at the sky, you will notice stars out there. And seemingly the stars just occupy random spots in the night sky. But if you take a look very, very closely, they form clusters or groupings and they're called constellations. And they've always been called constellations. And when you recognize the constellations, you will recognize that they form a kind of picture. 
they're kind of grouped together somehow. It is the same with everything that is contained in the psyche. We want to think that things are independent. So for example, if you're drinking a cup of coffee, the cup of coffee that you have is independent of the, the cafe, it's independent of the table, and it's independent of the people who are around you. We like to think of things as having their own independent place. But when it comes to the psyche, we're going to observe, you're going to see that words, images, feelings, ideas, attitudes, plans about the future, thoughts about the past, memories, always, always come in clusters. They're always constellated around particular associated feelings and memories and images and so forth. Let me give you some very specific examples. I'm going to mention a word. And when I mention this word, Notice what happens when I just mention this word, mother. As soon as I mention the word mother, so many other things get brought in to that word and are associated with that word. You might have an image that comes to mind when the word mother is mentioned. If you've had a very pleasant experience with your own mother, the kind of feelings that you would get when I mentioned the word mother would be different from someone who has had a very overbearing mother, for example. And when I mentioned the word mother, and this is something that I've noticed in the context of therapy. Someone comes to me and sees me for therapy. And I mentioned the word mother and that person flinches. Why does that person flinch? It's because the word mother does not occur in isolation from all of those associations that are connected with the word mother. So the word mother is constellated around all these ideas and feelings and attitudes. You might have a sense of warmth inside when I mentioned the word mother, or you might have another sense in you when I mentioned the word mother. So the word mother does not occur in isolation from all of these images that you have in your head or all of these associations, they form a cluster. If you understand that, you will understand exactly what a complex is. Because a complex is a cluster of related feelings and attitudes and words and images and, uh, and behaviors clustered around a central core. Let's have another example. If I were to mention to you, for example, just the word masculinity, what comes to mind? If you happen to be a feminist, or if you happen to be someone who has had a lot of negative experiences with men, as soon as I mention the word masculine or masculinity, the first thing that might come to mind for you would be toxic masculinity or something that is very, very negative. So that word does not appear in isolation from all of those things that you associate with masculinity. If your experience with men has been very negative because the men that you have been around with have been abusive, then the very mention of the word masculinity or masculine will have that kind of an effect on you. It's like, for example, let's say you were very, 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 very religious. And let's say that you're very religious because <clears throat> at some point in your personal history, you experienced a tragedy. And while you were trying to, uh, trying to figure out what to do and how to bear the suffering associated with a tragedy, what you did was you prayed. And after you prayed, you had a particular feeling or a sense. And you got this experience 
which you might call uh, a religious experience. And this experience help you to get over all of that suffering that you experienced. And you came to the to this understanding or this idea or belief that you were helped by a divine being. So now your idea of God, your conception of God, your belief in God is very, very closely connected with that experience that you've had. So associated with the word God is not just the definition of God, but associated with that are all the things that you experienced in the past, which now cling to that very concept. So if you attend a philosophy class, for example, and the professor comes up and says, let's do philosophy of religion, all right? Let's do philosophy of religion. Let's define what God is. God is a being that is, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, um, omnipresent, and whatever. And let's take a look at that, and let's see whether this is actually uh, something that makes sense or whether there is an underlying logical contradiction. So here is the philosopher now in front of you, your teacher, and tries to show you that the very idea of God is inconsistent. If you have had a particular experience and that experience gets you to think about God in a very, very powerfully emotional way, as you are listening to the professor, you might regard this as a personal attack. The professor is not attacking you, nor is he attacking God. What he is doing is he is simply trying to talk about a particular concept. But for you, God isn't simply a concept. For you, the, the very word God is associated with all these warm feelings that you have inside as a result of particular experiences that you've had. So as soon as someone mentions the word God, or if you happen to be a Christian, someone mentions the word Jesus, so many things happen. In short, a cluster of ideas and feelings and images begin to emerge. And if that is very, 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 very strong, we could call it a complex. That is exactly what a complex is. Let me give you another example. You can tell, by the way, if a complex has been activated because when a complex gets activated, the person in front of you whose complex has been activated begins to act in a way that seems to be not objective at all. Let us say you are in a meeting and there's a whole bunch of you in that meeting and you're sitting in a circle, for example, and there are maybe eight of you or nine of you or 10 of you, and you're sitting down there and you are talking about the pandemic. And as you're talking about the pandemic, you're trying to figure out how to educate the people out there and to get them to actually go for a vaccination. Because, you know, a lot of people are afraid of, of, of being vaccinated and they need to be educated. They need to be motivated. And then, of course, everybody tries to come up with a, an idea, a creative idea, to get people to actually go out there and be vaccinated. How can we motivate people to be vaccinated? Oh, let's give them particular incentives, somebody might say. Or someone might say, oh, why don't we have, um, you know, a lottery? And if you get vaccinated, all right, you're given a ticket. And then later on, there's going to be uh, this lottery and you could win a million or whatever. Or you could get a discount if you go and uh, buy gasoline. So everybody comes up with certain ideas. And then one of the people there in the, uh, in the meeting says, oh, why don't we ask uh, priests to talk about this during their sermons when they give mass? And that seems like a pretty good idea, isn't it? But what if you bring up that idea? It's just an idea, right? It's just a suggestion. But as soon as you say that, one of the persons there 
who is sitting down and attending the meeting suddenly gets very, very, very angry. And everybody is surprised. Why is this person angry? He suddenly come, you know, he, he suddenly uh, expresses himself in a very emphatic way. And he says, priests, what do you mean priests? You can't trust priests. You can't trust the Christian church, the Catholic church who actually do this. You know, they're like this and they're like that. And he's, he's already practically yelling at the top of his voice. And everybody is wondering, uh, what's happening here? What's wrong here? And you try to convince that person that, look, we're just coming up with suggestions here, but it's too late. This person is now so energized by that sort of negativity regarding priests and the Catholic Church, he just cannot stop. You can't make him change his mind. He's absolutely convinced from the very core of his being that this suggestion is wrong and he cannot stop talking. It's, and if you try to stop him, you try to get him to think about things in a different way, it's impossible. It's like he's going on automatic pilot. It's like something got triggered and that's the perfect word to use to talk about complexes. It's like he gets, he's gotten, it's like there's a, program inside him and suddenly the program turns on and now it takes over and this person ceases to be rational ceases to see things from an objective standpoint and is now very very emotional now if we were to go into this person's personal history we might find out that maybe when he was six years old or seven years old you know uh he actually was very active in the church and he was abused by a priest. No wonder. So everything associated with the priesthood, everything associated with the Catholic Church, everything associated with masses, once that is brought up, guess what happens? It will trigger a particular response because the experience that happened to him in the past pulls, it's, it's like a magnet and pulls into that all of these related words, all of these related images, which now would trigger that particular set of emotions, which actually happened when he was really he was six or seven years old. That's what a complex really is. So today we have this word trigger. If a woman, for example, has been abused by a man, or has been abused by a number of men. What happens is whenever she reads a book or she watches a play or a movie where a man abuses a woman, what is going to happen? All of those emotions associated with her own abuse, they all come up again. And because they all come up again, what is going to happen is that uh, she will behave in a particular way. She might leave the movie house. She might leave the play. She might say, why didn't you give me a trigger warning? And she might say, what we need are safe spaces. It's a very, very, very common term that people use these days, safe spaces. Oh, we want our schools to, have to, to be a safe space. What does it mean? We want our school to be bland. So bland, in fact, that we, we need to make sure that there are no triggers for these complexes. You can tell when a complex has been triggered because um, the person is going to react very emotionally. The person would seem like he or she is possessed by something and that person goes on automatic pilot. We can have more examples later, but I wonder, is that something that clarifies what a complex is for you? Yes, definitely, Dr. Mike. Like You've explained it remarkably well with lots of examples and everything like that. I, I was just wondering whether, whether or not complexes are always negative since the examples you gave uh, seem to signify some kind of traumatic experience of some sort. Are there, would you say, positive complexes? Definitely. And you can tell that a positive complex has been triggered when, for example, here is someone who is in front of a leader 
And this leader is like a benevolent father. And that happens in politics a lot. If you want to win votes, what you could do is you could play on that. There are a number of people there out there who have very, very positive feelings about father and fatherhood, you know, protector and so forth. So in the presence of someone like that, what happens? They lose their objectivity. Oh, this person is going to protect me. Oh, this person is the one who is going to save me. So if that person happens to be a leader of a cult, what is going to happen is when you encounter that person and that person looks at you in a particular way, a positive complex gets triggered. And now you can no longer think critically about that person. You don't say, hey, maybe I am being taken in here. Maybe this person is trying to take advantage of me. Or maybe this person wants my money. No, those thoughts don't come about because as soon as you encounter that person, it's like, <gasps> You put a halo over that person's head and you think about that person uh, in, in such uh, positive terms. You put that person on a pedestal. It's a very, very common experience. You put that person on a pedestal, you bow down to that person. And as a result, you can no longer think straight. And it's a phenomenon that happens very regularly. You will notice that in... In, in certain political circles. I, I don't want to get into politics too much here, but father you could figures. imagine. Yeah, what, what, like a yes, strong man figures. A like, strong man, father figure who says, I'm going to be the one to protect you. And I'm going to be the one who will make sure that I get rid of what is evil out there in the world because this, this world where we live in is really a battle of good and evil and I represent the good part. As soon as that happens and if a complex gets triggered, that's it. You're going to, you might actually follow that person blindly and you might actually uh, defend that person in spite of all the evidence against him. Isn't that what happens in politics? Haven't you noticed that? It's like make yeah. America great again. Like America, exactly. you make it great. So, and then people see Donald Trump, for example, in this situation that I exactly. gave where they see him as like a figure where he will save America, et cetera, et cetera. Or even in Russia, people see Putin, Vladimir Putin as this strong man figure who, who will protect them from evil and so on and so forth. Something like that. Or in in the Philippines, like the figure of Duterte, for example. Exactly. Like strong and what, what, figures. Exactly. And what happens there, because a complex has been triggered, is you, you, you'll notice the emergence of a kind of a blind loyalty. And the word blind there is very, very, very important. Because you're going to be loyal no matter what happens. It's like being loyal to your very own father in your family. No matter how much this father of yours is attacked by outside forces, you're going to, uh, you're going to defend that father of yours because his family. Right? So yeah. maybe this very strong need to have a protector, a very strong need to have a, a father of this sort, if it has occurred in your experience for quite some time during childhood, it might create that kind of a complex as well. And so you're looking for something uh, to attach to that, 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 that positive image that you have, exactly. So I've, I've written down a few questions just sure. about all the things you've mentioned, Dr. Mike. So it makes me think, so these positive complexes, in a way, they're not truly positive because then, or rather not beneficial for the individual because then they lose control and they lose all sense of rationality or objectivity because then they're not able to think critically anymore and they're not in control of themselves. In a way, it's a positive experience, but it kind of like, uh, uh, it makes it mm. like they're orphans seeking something that they they want to have in their childhood or in their old experience as a complex. So it might be a positive experience, but then would you say that it's negative in the sense that it 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 makes a person lose control, or that it allows them to do things that are not what would you say good? 
Um, definitely, definitely. The thing is, when you live in the world and you encounter a situation, it's very important for you to be able to deliberate very well and to ask yourself, what should I do in this particular situation? What is the right thing to do? Huh? When you're caught in a complex, you can't even ask that question. You can't say, all right, let's look at the evidence. Let's see whether what this person is doing is right or wrong. Once you put that person on a pedestal, then you allow that person to take over because you can't think your way through anymore. I'll give you an example. One day, someone came up to me and said, you know, I've already broken up with my girlfriend and we've broken up. So what I've done is I've decided not to text her anymore. Why? Because if I do that, I'm going to get sucked in again and so forth. So in front of me, he mentioned that and he said, I'm not going to communicate with her anymore. Then he got a message from his girlfriend. And guess what happened 10 seconds later? He could not control himself. He just had to text back. Something took over. There was a very strong complex that suddenly came out and I could see it in his eyes. It is as if someone else took over and he was no longer himself. In a situation like that, it, it, was, it was in a sense positive because all the positive feelings began to arise again because he had put his girlfriend on a pedestal. So in that particular moment, he could not weigh things anymore. And he couldn't ask what is the proper thing to do in this particular situation. Remember, in order for you to have wisdom, you need to be able to know what to do in a particular situation you know, knowing what to do at the right time with the right intensity and so forth. This is what Aristotle talks about when he talks about wisdom, right? But in a situation like that, you just can't. And it just takes over you, even if it is positive. Sometimes um, that happens in romantic relationships, right? Uh, it's very, very, very positive, but you fall into it and you don't see, for example, that the other person is actually harmful to your own psyche. You might, for example, fall for someone who is abusive and yet not recognize that abuse, not recognize that the other person is gaslighting you, for example, because you've uh, a, a very, very positive complex has been triggered and you just overlook all those negativities in the other person. It's like someone who is very, very pro-Trump and doesn't see anything wrong and being a, a conservative Christian at that and not seeing anything wrong with all these dalliances, you know, all, all, the, all the affairs that he's had with maybe even with prostitutes and with porn stars and so forth. Yeah? Doesn't see that at all. Doesn't see how... Uh, he might actually be saying things just in order to get your money uh, and, and to contribute to his campaign. Yes. So that is my answer to your question. It might seem to be very positive, but it's very dangerous as well. Yeah. So in a sense, it's, posit it's a positive experience, but it's a negative outcome, potentially. Precisely. Like not beneficial for the person if that individual would rather have had control they probably wouldn't have wanted to or something like that right because it's what like happens possessed. yeah yeah what, what happens is that you lose yourself you're not yourself anymore so imagine that your psyche contains a number of sub personalities mm -hmm. and what happens is a sub personality emerges emerges and your ego is gone if there is a strong complex that is triggered it's like another person taking over inside of you, which is why you, you said it's a kind, it, it seems like a kind of a possession. You're no longer yourself. You can no longer think properly. So um, in that sense, you've lost control. And because you've lost control, you might do something you will regret later on. Because um, for example, okay, for example, let me give you an example. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, I was teaching in class, and while I was teaching and discussing the fallacies, I spoke about 
uh, hasty generalizations. And in the process of talking about hasty generalizations, I spoke about a woman whom I knew who said, you know, all men are jerks. And everybody in, in class laughed. And I go, yeah, it was probably a hasty generalization because of her own experiences with the particular men that she had encountered in the past. So if you've had an experience with five men and they were all jerks, and then you say all men are jerks, that's really a hasty generalization, isn't it? And everybody laughed. And then one of the women in class said, but sir, isn't it true that all men are jerks? She said that and she was laughed at in class. Why did they laugh at her? Because she said that at me and I am a man, <laughs> all right? By saying, but sir, all men are jerks. I go, really, all men? She goes, yes. And, th th and then she said, yes. And everybody laughed in class because the implication was I was a jerk as well. And she didn't realize that she was actually putting me down or insulting me. You get the picture? And then later on, after about five or 10 minutes, it took quite a long time. Suddenly she realized, oh my God, sir, sorry. <laughs> All right, You get the picture? She said something that she eventually regretted. Why? A complex had emerged, took over, and got her to say something that she eventually had to regret. And that was very minor. In certain situations, what happens is a complex uh, emerges. Uh, you'll find, for example, uh, kids. Someone says to the other kid, oh, your mother is, a, is like this or your mother is like that, you know? And the other kid, uh, or, or no, the, the, uh, the, 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 one boy says to another, all right, son of a bitch or something like that. And he gets very, very, very angry. What? You're calling my mom a bitch, you know? No, it's just an expression, right? But because of a very strong mother complex, what happens is he now gets very angry and he punches the other kid just for saying, son of a bitch. It had nothing to do with the other boy's mother. But the other boy had a very strong mother complex and so reacted very negatively to this and punched the other kid. And so both of them had to be sent to the principal's office and the bully had to be reprimanded for this. But why did that happen? That happened simply because that boy did not understand that this was just an expression and had nothing to do with his own mother. So yes, that's what happens. So in a sense, would you say that ideologies can, can be in the form of complexes, how it takes over your mind and how you can't think anymore and how this- Yes, this let me give you- is, yeah. Of course, let me give you an example. I had a conversation with a woman once. We were, we were walking and I had a conversation and I brought out a thought experiment. You know, I, I made her think that it actually happened, but it was actually just a thought experiment. And I said, hey, you know, um, I know this guy and he's married and he's having an affair with this woman, you know, and guess how she responded? She said, oh my God. God, you know, man, you know, uh, she happened to be a feminist, all right? And she said, oh my like, God, you know, man, you know, they're really like that. They're very toxic. They don't know how to commit themselves to just one woman. And they're really like that. They're, and then she went on and on and on and on. And there was nothing that I could do to stop her from, from what you and I might call male bashing. And uh, it took quite a while. And uh, I, I just nodded and I said, yeah, really, so, yeah, that's true. Some men are really like that. And she goes, no, it has something to do with the very nature of, of, of uh, masculinity itself, you know. Uh, it, then she went on about the patriarchy and, and how it's because of the patriarchal system that we have, which is why women are treated this way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And why men do not think twice about having multiple love affairs and so forth. And uh, she painted a very, very negative picture of men. A week later, I we had a chance to have, an, an, have another conversation. And I said, hey, I have this friend, this woman, you know, uh, this, uh, this uh, friend of mine, a woman, she's married and she's having an affair. This time, the situation is different. It's the woman having an affair. Guess how she responded? She said, good for her. The guy that she's married to must be a real jerk. Take it's note that too. it's his fault too, no matter what, it's his fault. So this is what happens when you get caught in an ideology. And um, I happen to be uh, someone who is sympathetic to the feminist movement. Uh, in short, 
I absolutely do not see why men and women should not be treated uh, fairly and equally, all right? Yeah. Uh, that they should have equal, uh, uh, you know, equal rights and so on and so forth. That, that's just basic humanity, right? And uh, I came across someone who was a rabid feminist, uh, you know, a very militant feminist, who said, you know, the, the problem with this world is men. It's really men. And I go, well, I'm a man too. And you know me. And you know, uh, you know my character. And she goes, yeah, by the very mere fact that you are a man, you are part of the problem. So, you know, you, you, you get what I mean. The, the, the ideology was so strong that she could no longer see me from an objective standpoint, no matter how well I treated her, no matter how, how much, you know, in our conversation, we had so many things in common. Yeah. And that happens with any ideology, whether it's a, the extreme left or extreme right, or if you happen to come from a very, very religious standpoint, or you're very religious and you think, yeah, it's okay to put down people from the LGBT community because uh, I thought you're supposed to love one another, uh, you know? Um, so once the ideology takes over, it's a very, very big complex as well. It makes you lose touch with what is truly objective mm -hmm. so yes you can tell when a complex has been triggered because um that person is now responding to you in a very emotional way this person isn't being objective and you can almost predict what this person is going to say there are some people for example who are so obsessed with money or power <laughs> or something else, the moment you discuss something related to money or power or religion, something else takes over and uh, they, they, they come from a position of what you yourself called ideology. So you talk about relationships, you talk about psychology, you talk about sociology, all of a sudden this person wants to talk about power relations. Everything is about power when in fact, it might not be about that all the time. So yes, when you notice, when you're having a conversation with someone and they always reduce the conversation to some favorite topic or some favorite ideology or some favorite philosopher, right, you can be pretty sure there's a complex there that has been triggered. Yes. So would you say, Dr. Mike, that uh, all, almost all ideologies are fueled by complexes or could there be a, an ideology present that's with the absence of a complex? Well, you ask yourself, let's say you read a, you, you read a book by Marx or you read a, a book by Freud or whatever because there are ideologies associated with those things, right? If you can read those books and then shift to another perspective, another worldview, you can remove yourself from that and say, let's look at this from a Freudian perspective. Set that aside. Let's look at this from a Marxist perspective. Set that aside. Let's look at this from a feminist perspective. And then set that aside. If you are able to do that, you're probably not um, possessed by that ideology. You are possessed by the ideology if you cannot help but always think from within one particular ideology and you cannot step out of it. If you try to step out of it, you feel like you're doing a disservice to that particular ideology. In short, you say, I'm committed to this. This is the way things need to be understood. These are the glasses that I've chosen to wear and these are the correct glasses. Okay. And uh, you're not willing to let go of those glasses and wear another pair of glasses. Then you can tell that it's really a complex involved there. So it seems that if one cannot step out of the ideology, there has to be some kind of complex at work. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I also noticed that from your examples that a complex seems to be like a combination of some psychodynamic uh, processes like there's a projection of a father figure and sometimes it's just a defense mechanism to prevent like oh I was uh, abused or I had this trauma before so it's like a trigger to them that's why it's like a self-defense mechanism so it's like all sorts of unconscious processes are at play when complexes are let's say activated right that's true that's true and um the thing that we need to understand here is that very often complexes are 
can be unconscious. There are complexes where you know the reason why you are being triggered. You had a particular trauma in the past. For example, um, when I had my house renovated, it was very, very difficult for me for a number of reasons. The workers were uh, were trying to take advantage of the of of, of me and the the the. Uh, there, there were other people trying to take advantage and just trying to get my money, and my 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 money was flowing out of my bank account like water, and it was it was kind of like a very traumatic for me. It was very very difficult. So now, if I'm in my house, everything is quiet. That's fine. As soon as I hear hammering in the neighborhood, guess what happens? It gets something gets triggered, and I start to feel particular emotions, uh, particular sensations. And uh, sometimes I don't know why these are there. And then I notice the hammering. In short, um, but I know that it is connected with the particular experiences that I had when I had my house renovated, right? Yeah. But sometimes, sometimes you're just walking or you're just having a conversation with someone. Someone drops a word and immediately there's a kind of response. But you don't know why then perhaps that complex is really unconscious and you don't even know why. It's just that, have you ever had that experience? You're having a conversation with someone and then suddenly there's a shift. That person uh, maybe doesn't want to talk about a particular topic or that person changes the subject or that person suddenly, uh, their, their, their emotions suddenly change. You can see it in their faces, right? Um, it's like whoosh suddenly this person is very sad or whoosh suddenly this person is very angry but the person doesn't know why it's probably of a, a word that you mentioned which is associated with particular experiences this person had in the past or maybe it's a, a particular topic that you brought up or a, a, a name of a particular person but this that other person that you're having a conversation with doesn't even know the reason why there was that kind of a reaction, then it's really unconscious. But that becomes very problematic because you are not in control of it. It just happens to you. So what you need to understand is uh, these are complexes and uh, you need to be able to find a way to deal with them. And one way of dealing with them is by uh, is by dream work because these complexes arise in your dreams as particular figures or images. They could appear as, a, as an animal. They could appear as a particular person. And then when you have conversations with those animals or persons that come up in your dream, you begin to recognize that they actually represent a particular complex that you need to address. But it's not easy to do that. It's actually easier to do it in the context of psychotherapy because your therapist will know right away when the complex has been triggered because he will he will notice it and he will point it out to you and he will say, see, there, there's the complex. Now let's deal with this right here and right now in the context of therapy. Yeah. And it might it might happen uh, through 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 art. It might happen through conversing, having a conversation with that uh, with that aspect of you. But what is really important is number one: recognize when a complex arises, and tell yourself this is a complex. I've lost control. Something has taken over. It is a complex. The more you pay attention to that, the more you recognize your complexes, the easier it becomes to manage them. You don't have to get rid of them, but you have to know that when a complex takes over, you can say, oops, I'm being possessed by a complex. I better not act in, you know, uh, according to this complex. I better not act out of this complex, let me let me go home. Let me lock myself up in my room and not communicate with certain people because I might act from this complex and do something I'm going to regret later. You get it? Yeah. So yeah, there's a complex. Oh my God, it's emerged. All right, I'm about to do something. All right, not in my control. I'm I'm about to yell or I'm about to do this or I'm about to you uh, say something. Nope, I won't. All right, and um, it, that's not easy to do when a complex emerges. It's awareness, it's like a kind of self awareness is very important. Yeah, yes. For example, let us say that you're a woman and uh, you were abandoned in, in childhood, 
maybe by a parent or whatever. And then later on, you were abandoned by your very first lover. The next time you have a relationship with someone, when that person looks at you in a particular way, for example, you might get the impression that this person wants to leave you, even if that is not true. So a complex has been triggered. What would you want to do? You want to say, hey, why, why are you going to leave me? Uh, all right. Oh, why, why did you go? Uh, are, are you now out with another woman? Can I see your phone? You might actually want to say those things. But if you say those things, you are going to create disharmony in your relationship with your current lover. Right? And that particular disharmony that you have created with your current lover is what will make your current lover leave and abandon you. A you get a picture, it, be prophecy. it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what you need to do is to recognize that it's just a complex and has nothing to do with the other person. That's very difficult to do, but you need to remind yourself, oops, it's, I'm in a complex. I want to do something. I want to yell. I want to, uh, you know, uh, I want to rein this person in. I don't want this person to leave the house. I want this person to be with me all the time because I don't want him to abandon me. Wait a minute. That's a complex. Let me just go out, uh, stay away from this. Let me just breathe with this and recognize that it's a complex and not act from this complex. And maybe what you could do is that complex um, um, can be con is usually constellated around a, a, a set uh, uh, you know constellation of images and so forth and becomes a sub personality. If you could talk to it em empathetically and to recognize, all right, I know you're here. Uh, okay, let's have a conversation. If you could actually do that, this is called active imagination by, by Jung. And if you could actually do that, there might be a change in the very nature of that complex. And it might actually weaken, but that usually takes a bit of time. But the very first thing to do really is to be aware of the fact that you have particular complexes and to be aware that they could take over. That they exist and, and to recognize and that they ex their, right yeah. exactly exactly it's like acknowledging that they are there rather than ignoring their existence exactly exactly it's like the first step to actually talking to them so to speak wherein you can like these sub personalities they they can take over you and we have to be aware of that and in a way that's how we deal with complexes because yes but let me say something me, else yeah. before i forget yeah but let me say something okay. else before ahead, i forget it's hard to do that while you are in the grip of a complex. It's very difficult because you lose control already. Do it later. For example, right here and right now, all right? Right here and right now, you might not be in the grip of a particular complex. But ask yourself, in the past week, in the past months, under what situations did I lose control and something took over and I said something or acted in a particular way that, uh, you know, uh, that seemed like I was being possessed by another personality. Ask yourself, what were those conditions? So now you are not gripped by that complex. Um, you are just aware that you have those complexes and that could be a very good starting point. This is why, now this is why the whole idea of self-knowledge uh, can be very, very fruitful. It's no, knowledge, self. not, yeah, it's, it's not knowledge of, of, you know, my, 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 my preferences, but the knowledge of all those things that take over and get me to lose control. Who are right? the so you think, personalities within. Right. What this, yeah, what those subpersonalities are. And then you ask yourself, all right, what could they be? And if you could name them, uh, this, you know, if you could give a name to that, it would be interesting. Because the next time you are gripped by that particular complex, you can name that subpersonality, you know? So for you, Steve, for example, you might call that subpersonality something else, you know? J uh, Jerry, all right? Oh, oh, Jerry's here, you know? Uh, and uh, Jerry's really mad, or uh, Jerry's really uh, very, uh, very possessive now. And let's, hey, Jerry, you know? And to have that kind of a conversation with, with uh, that particular aspect of yourself. That's mm -hmm. very important. So like Sorry, I had to interrupt here. you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Uh, but but uh, it, it came to mind that, you know, here I am talking about being aware of these complexes, but it's very difficult to do that while you're in the grip of a complex. You have to wait, all right, uh, until it's gone and go, all right, that was a complex. Okay, yes.
Yeah. So it could be after the complex has occurred, and then you're realizing, oh, what have I done, or what have I yes, done in exactly. the past days, in the past weeks, or in a sense, it could also be before it arises again, like you're aware of it before it happens again. So that maybe when you feel like it's about to come up, you could you could uh, stay away from the triggers or the. No, no, don't stay away from the trigger. That's not the proper way of doing it, all right? If you stay away from the trigger, what's going to happen is um, you're never going to have a way of changing it. What you mm -hmm. need to do is to be aware. Let's say, for example, you, you, you recognize that the, a particular complex gets constellated or gets triggered in the presence of a particular person or a particular mm -hmm. type of person. Know that and tell yourself before you meet that person, in advance, tell yourself, I know a complex is about to be triggered. Let's see what happens this time. Okay. Since you have prepared for it, you, you put yourself in that situation. Um, it's like testing yourself now. Let's see what happens. Let's see if I am able to say to myself that it's a complex. Let's see if I can, uh, before when that complex got triggered, immediately I reacted. Let's see if the reaction, if, if I can pause and prevent that immediate reaction from happening this time. So I'm going to react after 10 minutes instead of after one millisecond. You get it? Then what is happening is um, it's it's like you're, you're exposing yourself to that particular oh, yeah. trigger. Incrementally, right? perhaps. Yes, you are, you are exposing yourself to that particular trigger because uh, you don't want that particular situation to trigger you anymore in the future. But avoiding it, is not going to help because yeah. later on you might encounter it and then you're going to, yeah, the, the you're, not prepared. Yeah. you're not prepared anymore. So that's the best thing to do. The other thing that you can do is to be sensitive to the very notion of complexes. How, how, how do, you, do you become sensitive to this whole idea of people having complexes? It's like this. When you converse with someone, pay attention. Take note of times when there is a shift. Take note of um, patterns. If that person always talks about a particular subject matter, you can be sure there's a there's a complex involved. Or if you bring up a particular topic or say something and that person changes the topic, you can be sure you have hit a complex. All right. Or if you say something and this person goes on and on and uh, cannot think straight up, you know, a complex has been triggered. So Pay attention when you are having conversations with other people and notice their reactions and say to yourself, ah, here is a context where a complex has been triggered. Once you make that habitual, then the idea of complexes uh, will be so ingrained that you see it around you. You see it in the patterns of, of, of people's behaviors and people's emotional reactions and so forth. And then you will see it in yourself as well. You see, it's easier to see it in other people than in yourself. Yeah. But once it becomes a habit, you start seeing it in yourself as well. I suppose it really would be helpful if you have someone to help tell you what your complexes are. That would be very, very, very helpful. If you could, uh, if you have a very good friend or if you, um, it might be hard if it's with a, uh, with a significant other, like a lover or so forth, but if it's with a very, very good friend whom you can trust and uh, if you, uh, if you're very honest about it and you're willing to explore your own complexes, then you can talk about complexes with that other person and tell the other person, all right, from now on, all right, what I would like you to do is every once in a while, uh, I would like you to... Uh, point out what my complexes are. It's 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 not going to be easy because as soon as that person points out a complex, you're going to be very defensive. And it you're going to be by it too. It'll be yeah. But since you you had the intention of wanting mm. to know your complexes, that might uh, put it in a in a different perspective, you know, because the context is now different. It might be a transformative experience. Perhaps. Yes, it could be a transformative experience, right? It might end up with you laughing. Hmm. You mentioned that it might be difficult with a significant other. I'm interested in why, why you said that. Uh, because it might, it might cause conflict, hmm. particularly if the complex has something to do with your relationship with the other person. Oh yeah, especially. If it directly yeah. concerns the other, then- Yes, it be yes, yes. It might, it might, uh, I, I wouldn't suggest that you do it in that particular context, which is why it's easier to do it with, uh, to uh, explore complexes with a friend or a therapist. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because so in a once, sense, yeah, sorry. Once you, uh, you, a complex arises in you and you have your lover in front of you or a significant other in front of you, uh, the other person might, a, a complex in the other person might get triggered as well. And if, if both of you uh, have been triggered by, by a, a set of complexes, uh, it's, 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 it's not going to be healthy anymore. It's going to cause a lot more resentment later on. That's why. <laughs> You're both triggered by complexes, then that's just yes, not a good yes. situation to be. It's not a good situation to be at all. Yes. So, Doctor Mike, would you say that uh, the way to integrate complexes are by the, the means that you mentioned, like slowly exposing them yourself to them, but being aware of it by being prepared First, for it, being like, aware, no, being yeah. aware, being aware, recognizing very, that very important. these uh, subpersonalities exist, and, and among other people and and yourself. Yes, but yeah. remember, when you're aware of these complexes inside you, it's very important not to try to will them away. Mm-hmm. The more you try to will them away, the stronger they become. It's very paradoxical. It's like you know, uh, uh, saying to yourself that you're not going to think of a pink elephant, and that's exactly what you're thinking of when you say that. So um, one, just say to yourself, or they're there, and try to befriend them a little bit. Jerry and sure- John... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, befriend them a little bit and uh, say, all right, they're there and they're pro- there's probably a good reason why they're there. It's probably because of a certain mechanism inside of you that's tried to protect you from something. And recognize that and just recognize the fact that you want to uh, somehow find a way to manage the complexes. Not really get rid of them first, but really to manage them. Because sometimes they don't go away. Sometimes they're very strong, but you're able to manage them. Or maybe you're able to reframe them and see them in a different light. And that's the importance of what you mentioned, that instead of um, being aware of a complex and saying, okay, later I'm going to meet this particular person. Instead of willing it to stop, you're just going to say, let's see what happens. Instead of trying to control it, you're just going to try to let it be. And because of that intention of being aware in itself, that might be a transformative uh, experience for yourself with with your complex. Exactly. Um, a lot of people would say that this is a form of mindfulness. And when, when you're mindful of what is happening to, to your body, your sensations and your reactions, all right, what happens is uh, they become, you know, they, they, they're not going to possess you anymore as a result. It's, it's kind of like the notion of just meditating where at the beginning, Precisely. If, you, if, you're, uh, if you're not experienced in meditating, these thoughts will seemingly possess you, but then as time goes by, if you become more experienced, you can just let the thoughts go, but you're mindful of them, but then you're not gripped by them. Exactly. Anymore. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So and, really, yeah. Um, the, the whole idea of complexes is very, very, very important. If there was one particular idea of Carl Jung that I would like to get across to people, it's really this whole idea of complexes. In fact, if you want to talk about talk about archetypes and so forth from Carl Jung, uh, it, it's it's still better to start off with complexes. Yes, uh, because these are the things that if you address, you will find of a kind of a transformation in 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 you, a transformation for the better. Yes. It's great we did it for episode two and for episode one, synchronicity. So, yes, that's right. I guess we could even think of the, the link between synchronicity and uh, complexes. You mentioned just now that that if we're able to deal with these uh, complexes that we have, that there might be a really good beneficial transformative effect to ourselves. So one could say that the complexes that we begin to develop or we experience or actually synchronistic events in our lives that allow us to transform into certain certain versions of ourselves. You you could put it that way. Yes, you could put it that way. Um, although um, you, you don't really have to bring in synchronicity in order to talk about complexes. That's but true. maybe what, what might happen is while you are working with complexes, synchronistic events might happen. For example, like uh, here you are trying to deal with these complexes and you start encountering people who keep triggering, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, yeah. that, that very same complex that you're trying, to, uh, you're, you're trying to manage and it becomes more difficult to manage. It's like, am I being tested here? You know, that might arise. And so here you are 
trying to manage a complex and it would be easier to manage a complex if you don't meet the very same kind of people who would trigger that complex. But in the next week or two, while you're trying to manage it, you meet, you know, a thousand people <laughs> along the way. And it's like, why is this happening? And that's where you might wonder whether there is synchronicity involved. Yes. Yeah. So that means it might exactly be what you needed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it goes again with what you mentioned a while ago, Dr. Michael Fowl. You just incrementally expose yourself to these things instead of running away from them. It's like the exposure therapy, like facing your shadow, I guess, so to speak. Precisely, precisely, precisely. precisely. It's like getting over your phobia, but then in this sense, it's uh, managing your complexes or managing your triggers by exposing yourself to them more and more. Just, just being aware of it, just incrementally allowing yourself to come into contact with these things that are actually your complexes, these constellations, these associations that you have with these particular emotions, people, experiences, and so forth. Exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah. And then once we, we slowly integrate them, we call them by their names, we recognize them that we, we transform and we develop our personality even more. And I guess we come closer to the Jungian self right, or the ideal, so to speak. Exactly, exactly. And um, it'll be, uh, you're, you're going to reach a stage where you're able to reflect and deliberate and to do things which are really more beneficial for your inner self. Because uh, the complexes create a lot of noise. And because they, they create a lot of noise, it's more difficult for you then to connect with the core of what you really want because the complexes take over and you can't hear what you really want to do and what you really want to get, uh, what you really want uh, from, 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 from the world. It, it's, 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 you know, it's all, all, all this noise you know, uh, uh, preventing you from hearing that and from, from recognizing that. Yeah, from, so from, uh, let's say, a spiritual perspective, it's like, the Maya, the illusion that that yes. befuddles you, you. You could say it. You could you, you could you could say that. Yes, correct. Or even it's a complex as might even be a form of attachment that the Buddhists talk about about letting go of your attachments. That oh, might that, that's a nice way. That's a very nice way of putting it. Yes, exactly. And it's not just uh, desires and wants and needs, but perhaps the complexes are actually you know your desires, wants, and needs, or right, I need right, to be right. angry. I need to. To, to be reactive and need to be emotional. And then if you can let go of it, then you can, as you mentioned, Dr. Mike, you, uh, you put it beautifully, how you're, you're in touch with yourself now, which is like closer to enlightenment even, so to speak again. Yes, and um, we have to be very careful. We can't say, oh, let's get rid of all the complexes. Mm. Um, you, you can never get rid of all the complexes. That's impossible. That's, in, that's uh, humanly impossible. But there are some complexes which are, which are useful. For for mm -hmm. example, let, let us say you're a, you're a musician, for example, and uh, you you idolize a particular musician, and as a result, when, when you uh, see that person on the concert stage, and all sorts of feelings arise, and uh, you put that person on a pedestal and so forth, but it inspires you to create music. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's a, a, some kind of complex there, but I wouldn't call that complex uh, creative as something energy. That, that, it's it, it's it's more creative, you know, and so uh, that's a complex as well. But you have to distinguish between complexes which are like that and complexes mm -hmm. which just you know are, are detrimental to uh, to your personality. It's like performers are what would you say possessed by a Dionysian energy to perform. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's like right, that. right, 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 like, right. Exactly. So would you even say complexes are uh, related to trans states? Like when you're in a trans state and you're performing. Precisely. Good, good word, good, good term. Because once you are possessed by a complex, you are in a kind of a trance. Yes, precisely. Yeah. Like you're in a, I guess, in a state of self hypnosis, even. Yes, 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 exactly. Or I guess if you're triggered by a complex outside of you, like a person, then that me, that might be an unintentional hypnosis on yourself by yourself through an external force or object outside of you. That's one way that of putting way, it. I suppose. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Why not? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. So I, I suppose I, I, I also just uh, uh, was reading about the Oracle of Delphi just the other day and 
it made mm-hmm. me think maybe they're possessed by complexes like they're in a trance state because they're possessed by these by this apollonian energy right that's why they they give all these prophecies because apollo is like also the god of prophecy and illumination so that uh-huh. might be a complex also like a complex of being possessed by a uh, prophetic energy even exactly would you say that hmm. i guess it's possible <laughs> Yeah, you could say mm-hmm. that, but I think uh, that leads us to something else, uh, yeah. because this is really uh, y- you're trying to put yourself in a particular trance. Mm-hmm. You're trying to put yourself in a particular altered state of consciousness. So suppose- this is done. Uh, this is done mm-hmm. voluntarily. So you put yourself oh, into yeah, a trance voluntarily, and then what you're trying to do is you're trying to be a receptacle of 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 it's some vessel, particular. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're a vessel. So this is different from a complex. So, so it's like a different topic entirely. You're like, you're like yeah, it's a different using, topic entirely. You're using active imagination to be a, a receptacle for a certain archetype, like the archetype of uh, prof- prophecy. Exactly. Or exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. O- although I thought of one thing, another thing, uh, Doctor Mike, if, if I may, are addictions uh, complexes, so to speak, like if you're addicted to something, you're addicted to gambling, and so forth, or playing games, or you know. There might be a complex there, right? Where you're triggered of a certain experience, and then, for example, people um, are triggered by certain triggers, and then because of that, they suddenly go into alcoholism. Like, that, that could be a complex. It could be, but that's a very interesting question. I'll have to think more deeply about that. Um, yes, there are certain situations which, when you encounter them, uh, triggers a particular some something takes over and you cannot help but go out there and I, I must have something I must have a drink or I must have a smoke or I must have something. Um, yeah. It could be part of a complex, but I don't know. Maybe not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. but yes, I, 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 I can way, see why. Yeah. I guess the yeah. best way is to just ask personally yourself, like, "Oh, Jerry popped up whenever you you feel like drinking some." alcohol then maybe it has something to do with it maybe jerry likes to drink alcohol whenever this occurs or like you can talk to your sub personality and maybe you can find out about it i suppose yeah you could you could do that as well yeah, yeah well i think that's that's a really good conversation complexes i think we've we've tackled a lot of things we uh address a lot of questions and i think that's that's a really good conversation what do you think dr mac yeah, I really enjoyed our, our conversation today. And uh, I'm glad that you asked me particular questions because it got me to really think more closely about the nature of complexes. Sometimes, you know, uh, at particular times in our lives, we think about particular uh, concepts like, uh, let's say, complexes. And then time passes and you forget about it. Yeah. The, the, the fact that we're having this conversation helped me to think about particular complexes. And it was very synchronistic as well because... The past few days, I've been, I think, uh, uh, I've been focusing on a particular complex that have that has come up for me, and uh, by 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 talking about this, it 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 made that even clearer to me. Yeah. So yes, yeah, that was a wonderful com- conversation. Yeah, I've I've learned a lot, and you know, it's always good to remind ourselves of certain concepts. As you said, sometimes we forget, and then it's just good to remind and revisit things that we might have known, and it's good to share to our audience here too. So that they learn a lot of things that we're learning as well, continually. So that's great. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, all right, yeah. I suppose that's that's it for this episode, episode two, Complexes. So thank you once again, uh, Dr. Mike, for being my co-host. Thank you as well. And I'll see you again next time. Well, that's it for episode two of the Rise from Eden podcast with Steve and Dr. Mike. We hope you had a wonderful time and thank you for listening. Have a great day.